I'd like to welcome everyone to the Bayless Public Library for this program that's being put on by Three Lakes Group Sierra Club with the help of um, Deanna and Mark Jones and Cindy and John Dutcher from the Farmer's Market. Um, tonight is entitled Vegetable Gardening in the UP. And the next one is next Tuesday, March 26th from 6.30 to 8.00. A horticulturist Neil Moran will present a fun interactive gardening 101 workshop on soil building seed selection and more he says there's nothing like growing your own fresh wholesome vegetables and colorful flowers he will cover the basics of gardening and give you some secrets to growing a wonderful garden in this short season zone handouts with valuable gardening tips will be provided so the list is there to sign up if you haven't you can also email him at Hey, like at neilmoran.com. Either way, we'll get we'll get the names to him, so so he'll know how many handouts to make. And he will also have his three gardening books available for purchase and signing. The impetus for these two gardening programs came as a result of the film showing of getting real about food in the future, presented by our group as part of our 20th anniversary celebration last fall. Participants were passionate about growing their own vegetables and needed help with their gardening problems. We pledge to arrange <laughs> the local experts to give you a hand with this. Uh, Jenny Johnson and Diane Meyer made the agreement. Jenny's with us tonight, Diane is not. Tonight's speakers, Mark and Deanna Jones of Beaver, Creek, Beaver Meadow Creek Farm and Cindy and John Dutcher of Dutcher Farm will cover topics including planting, growing, harvesting a wide variety of plants that can be successful in the EUP, as well as addressing questions about gardening problems. Mark and Deanna have been farming since 2004. They participate in the farmer's market in the Sioux, are starting their fourth year of running a community-supported agriculture, CSA, operation. Their products are also available at their roadside stand at Harmony Health Food Store and Upper Crust Pizza. They are now raising sheep and pigs and will have lamb and pork available this year. Cindy and John have been farming, farming for over 30 years, growing a variety of vegetables and blueberries. They participate in the Sioux Farmer's Market, the Pickford Farmer's Market, and Harmony Health carries their vegetables and eggs. In addition, they raise beef cattle, sheep, goats, laying and meat hens, Thanksgiving turkeys, and occasionally pigs. They will all share their extensive knowledge with you, tailored to gardening in the EUP, and address your gardening questions. Welcome to you all, and thank you. Cindy. I'm Mark. I'm Deanna. Mm -hmm. Our farm is Beaver Meadow Creek Farm. And I'm John. This is my wife, Cindy. Cindy. And we live out in Raper. We're about 45 miles south of here or so. And um, mm -hmm. I guess we don't really have a, a true agenda for the evening because with this being an educational session, I thought maybe we should leave things mm -hmm. uh, instead of talking so much about us. Question, lots of questions and answers we hope uh, so, because we went unless you tell ask us questions we have no idea what information you're looking for <laughs> so we hope to uh, at least when you leave here tonight answer some of your questions yeah basically <laughs> um, you know that's what I was thinking that's like if we knew what you wanted to know when you came here that would help a lot <laughs> yes. um, so what Mark was thinking if you guys wanted to ask questions then we could um, just answer and then it might spark more interest in, I don't know if that's how you guys want to run it or well I can talk for a few minutes while somebody thinks of some questions <laughs> I guess <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty good at talking usually um, we have been farming my wife and I have been farming up here for over 30 years and uh, when we first came up here we were told well you know there's not much you can grow here but after 30 years down the road, we figured out there's really not much that you can't grow here. Uh, barring citrus and avocados and you know, things like that. Uh, but we, we grow a very wide range of vegetables every year and we're always experimenting, trying something new. Uh, last year I grew some uh, French uh, Charente type cantaloupes, some Asian melons, uh, which I had never done before. I had no idea what they were going to do. Uh, they did well. I know Mark also grows some of the Asian <coughs> um, So that's, um, I think, 
the idea that we can't, that we're quite limited on what we can grow here is, is really not true. I think yep. uh, variety selection is really important for what you want to grow. Um, we grow a lot of tomatoes and peppers and we usually select varieties that are from Russia or Siberia or somewhere <laughs> 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 and we've had really quite good success even in those years where we have real short summers um, we grow a lot of cabbage and cauliflower and broccoli and all the coal crops do really well here even if the nights are chilly because they like cool nights and that's cold, C O L E, not yes. cold. Yeah. <laughs> um, like cold uh, slop. Yeah, like cold slop. Um, basically, we, we experiment quite a bit and we start our own plants. Um, we, we sell tomato and pepper plants too at the farmer's market. Actually, there's quite a few farmers there that do um, sell plants. And lately we've gotten quite interested in seed saving. Um, that's my next new thing to learn more about. Um, there's going to be a, a Sheila Bergdahl at, in Pickford with the uh, Pickford Library is planning on starting a seed savers exchange locally. And uh, there's going to be a, an initial meeting, I believe April 23rd at the Pickford Library. And, uh, Seeds are pretty amazing because even after the first season that you grow seeds and save them, they start to adapt to our region. And that's pretty important. Um, we also, we don't use any chemicals on our farm. We're, we have livestock, so we have access to manure. And we slaughter chickens, so we compost all of our offal and we use that as a potting soil. Uh, but you can also purchase some good organic potting soil from uh, either local farmers if you can find somebody who's got a, a good supply of uh, folks, manure. I think you're dealing in gardening soil now, are you? A little bit, yeah. And then there's, yeah, there's Dare You. I see we got a couple questions. We'll start here. Maybe. I was wondering, like, so if you don't have much for a greenhouse, it's like you start your seeds indoors. It's like you want to try and get them started earlier outdoors. It's like, do you have to have things like cold frames, or do you use? Do you guys use like tunnels in that? Oh, uh, we don't. The soil more, uh, or? We use cold frames, and we also we have a lot of uh, glass on the southern side of our house, mm -hmm. so we utilize that also. <clears throat> um, the cold frames, and, and you have to remember too. You don't want to get too big of a hurry here to get things out mm -hmm. because. I've seen years, and, and there's rarely two years the same, but um, I've seen years where 8th of June, we've gotten a hard frost. Um, so I, I try not to push it too much in the beginning and not get too big of a hurry. Just if I'm doing transplants, I want my plants healthy, strong, and ready to go into the ground. You guys, you use hoop houses? Are you talking about seedlings? Uh, starting, starting, starting seeds, yeah, starting we, plants. We have a... a, a twin wall polycarbonate greenhouse that we start all our seedlings in. Um, it's heated with propane. Um, it, we tend to start a lot early to sell, but the ones that we actually use will usually space out and start later. Um, you know, if, you're, if you have a small garden, one of the advantages of a small garden is that you can kind of pamper the things a little bit. Um, you know, you set out a thousand tomato plants. I can't put buckets over a thousand tomato plants, but if you have five, you know, you can put buckets over and you can paint them. So you actually have a little advantage there as far as being able to control nature if you do get a hard frost, something like that, if you get them out early. But if you get them out too early, they don't do well anyway. Sometimes they even become stunted and you're better off, you know, now waiting. But, you Especially know, if you're direct planting. If you're direct garden. planting. You know, every year is, is completely different. So there's not even a magic date, you know, mm -hmm. uh, for anything. But so you know, with our CSA, also we have to look at harvesting. We have to have things every week for 16 weeks. So we have to not only, it's you know, we used to just okay, it's Memorial Day, let's go plant our garden. Well, we don't do that anymore because you have to make sure they have lettuce every week for 16 weeks. So you have to stagger everything and look at it. It's the whole way, different way of looking at things. Mm -hmm. you know? And we just started thinking that way. 
the last what last two yeah. years mm -hmm. learning to stagger that's the hardest thing to make it last throughout the season you know um, one other note about if you want to start your plants and you don't have a cold frame and you don't have room you can use a small fluorescent light make sure it's a brand new bulb because if the bulb's even one year old it they won't do well. They're full spectrum. And Keep that light right that close to the top of your plants. And you can still put them in a sunny window, but they'll need additional light mm -hmm. if they're in the sunny window. But that'll work well, but then you have to harden them off after you, which you have to set them outside on a either cloudy day or... Because they can they sunburn, burn. wind burn. Or yeah. they get yeah, sunburn you, and wind you got to watch burn. sunny windows because they, they tend to get laggy too. And, and what she's talking about, put them right on top of them. And walk on down the plants. Yeah, I mean, you know. If my mother-in-law was here, she would also tell you that to put a fan on them. Yes. To rotate, yeah. like yeah. to make their stocks a lot hardier. Right. Sure. I was stronger. just gonna ask, uh, is, uh, like, is direct planting like out of the question here? I mean, I've gardened in the South for the last eight years and I've never started seedlings. I, I mean, I'm, I'm quite, I'm, I'm intimidated by starting seedlings and harding them off. I mean, that is mm -hmm. something I've never done. I've gardened for eight years and never done it. and. So I'm just curious. Well, it depends on what you're talking about. Yes. I mean, there are. There I mean, are by now I would have already, you know, have harvested, you know. Sure. Things, so. <laughs> 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 it depends on what you're talking about, and sometimes you can do both, even if you want we extended do. harvest. Yeah. Um, but you know it. But you all do. You do. We do. Well, that makes me have hope, like a little bit, because I thought it's so short that I wouldn't even have time. When I think of seedlings, the bit. I mean, we we grow just about everything we do transplants and direct seedlings, with the exception of tomatoes. We don't direct seed. Peppers. We don't direct seed. Um, Corn, we don't. See, yeah, no, don't I have started. Yeah, I was gonna say, I started peppers and tomatoes inside before and had bad luck. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah, yes. bad luck. Hard. Hard. It just, yeah, it didn't, didn't work out so it's, well. It's it's very, it's it's a lot easier in a greenhouse than yeah. it is in the house. Yeah. I, mm -hmm. It really is. They require yeah. a real bright light source, and they have they're heavy feeders. And if you're using a commercial potting soil mix, mm -hmm. you're probably not going to have real good luck with that unless you're wanting to use chemical fertilizers mm -hmm. with it or if you have access to compost tea but they do real well in compost and, and but light for tomatoes and peppers is really a key mm -hmm. thing it's real important was there a specific variety like uh, kind of vegetable or you no i kind of do a whole bunch of well not yeah. i haven't done a whole bunch here i mean last year all i did was i actually we got here in july and i bought some stuff from the farmer's market some plants and stuff and i had great luck just in contain just doing some small mm -hmm. container gardening because we just got here and I thought I missed April but I guess I was right on target in July. <laughs> 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 we never put our tomatoes and peppers out until at least the second week of June because usually the nights are too cold. And I don't plant my potato for our own consumption because uh, I don't sell potatoes. I just we just grow them for ourselves. Um, and I never plant my potatoes until after the fourth of July. Oh really? Yeah, really? Yeah, because the first cycle of the potato beetle is their breeding cycle is over. Over. And last year I picked, uh, I think, two adult beetles and about six larvae. And generally, if I plant early, I'm just fighting those beetles right through until their breeding cycle is over. And I generally end up hurting the plants so bad the beetles do. Raleigh, you had a question? Yeah. Too. Do you find that the uh, heirloom variety do as well or as good as the regular? I think they seeds? do. Personally, I think they do better because we select seeds and most of our plants are heirloom uh, varieties um, we do a few hybrids but, which is not they're not GMO it's just cross um, but I find that uh, because we select a seed from the areas that Cindy talked about from Siberia Kazakhstan uh, Russia Dakota, Canada <laughs> right we, we try to find areas where the seed come from that you know is similar to what our areas and they seem to do what uh, much better yeah it's heirloom is such a general term that it you can't just say well look I want to grow an heirloom because it's going to do better here it there are zillions of them you know mm -hmm. and then they're all different varieties all different you know day lengths all different um, harvest windows and what they're used to and so on so you can't just pick an heirloom 
because it's narrow and you got to look at what variety it actually is and where it came from. So I could use an example of uh, Country Gentleman's Shoe Peg Corn. That's an open pollinated <clears throat> type uh, sweet corn. It grows well in Kentucky and South, but you'll never get a ripe year here. No. It's an open pollinator and it's more than likely an heirloom variety, uh, but it's not going to fit our growing season because it's a, it's a 110 day sweet corn. That's what I was going to so, say. You know, within the, the varieties, it's, it, I mean, the, there's really no difference in saying, okay, I, I don't want to grow a hybrid because it's not going to grow up here, I want to grow an heirloom. They're both, within both groups, you have to pick individual varieties that are that you want to work with. And that's not to say in a good year like, say, last year, that you wouldn't get a something to mature that's a late a longer you know variety but it's not always the case oh we've been kind of spoiled the last four or five yeah. years or so yeah. with our, yeah. our our frost not coming until october i remember 30 years ago if your tomatoes weren't right by labor day you weren't getting tomatoes <laughs> and, uh, unless you brought them inside wrapped them in paper you know but uh, now in the last few years things have been a lot different and, uh, we've planted fall gardens which we never did 25 30 years ago so what do you think that planting season would be like this year? This this <laughs> growing season. The ground's not, the the ground's ground's not frozen. The ground's not frozen underneath the snow. Yeah, so true. as long as we don't get a big, great, huge melt all at once and all the moisture runs off, as long as we keep doing this thaw and, and, and freeze, uh, chances are the soil will pick up a lot of that moisture and we should have a much better growing season. I'm really hoping because we had to buy hay last year and I, I don't like doing that. <laughs> we had one in the back first. Um, um, you mentioned heavy beers like peppers and um, tomatoes. <coughs> tomato can go a little wild in my raised bed last year. I was wondering if there's any, like what the best natural way would be to replenish the soil so that I can. Do you compost at home in your kitchen? I just started, I'm not sure if it's gonna be ready this year. Okay, um, you could get some locally manure, rotted manure. rotted manure, works really good, and apply some on top and work it in. Um, They're selling garden amendments, uh, dairy dew is available up in Ken Ross too. Mm -hmm. I, uh, um, we sell a, um, it's, it's a line called Agran, and uh, it's a line of natural and organic fertilizers, and you can buy just bone meal too, liquid bone meal, liquid um, kelp and potash, and then a natural fertilizer that's uh, fish based. It and smells like and it's <laughs> <laughs> I spent most of the summer last year smelling like fish. I really it really good, but it um, it it's is amazing. it's amazing, and I actually have even started using it on some of my lawn accounts. Um, like I started using it for Nelia, so we're gonna watch the lawn and see how it does there. <laughs> um, but, uh, and it's a good way, and you can even add it to uh, something that you're composting to help jumpstart that, that whole soil biology and get it going, you know? It's ag -grand. and I, I have some handouts that I can give you if you're interested in something. Another thing too up here is most of our soils are acidic. So you do need lime, you or, know, in your garden. Just, your you, can, uh, you can get pH test kits, uh, fairly inexpensive. Uh, Around, or the you know, you can get strips that you takes a clump of soil and put in water, put your strip in, and it'll give you your pH, match it against a chart. Mm -hmm. Or you can spend a few more bucks and get one that has a probe that you can stick into the soil and it'll give you a reading, the right, uh, you know, with the battery power. And one caution about peppers: uh -huh. peppers, if you have a lot of nitrogen in the soil, you'll get a great big huge pepper plant, and you won't get any blooms on it or any peppers. Beautiful plant. But because peppers prefer a little poorer soil, actually. Oh, good. I brought some in last year, and I was right after I fertilized and stuff. They weren't doing anything outside, and I brought them in pots in the winter, and I got <coughs> ones inside. So that could have been because the um, soil lake wasn't quite as high of a quality at that point, or probably. The ones inside did yeah. better, or yeah, they did better after they'd been in the soil for a while. And yeah, because when you water it, it leaches yeah. out excess nutrients a lot of times yeah. hmm. if, if we were going to start seeds under lights how, how would you say to do it if we don't have a greenhouse what kind of container and what kind of soil well um, we, here, go ahead. we buy um, dirt, um, well, we base our potting mix is it's called Promix um, it's a Canadian it's it's um, <coughs> peat moss based 
uh, potting soil. And then we usually add um, some of the agrand and we actually add worm castings to it. Um, and that's what I, you know, we started using it a while back and I like it because it doesn't grow weeds. Because <laughs> yeah. a lot of times you get uh, different things in there growing weeds and making a mess with your seedlings. Mm -hmm. And um, because I was growing, you know, we had, you know, thousands of transplants and it was hard to keep up with the weeds on them. And, you know, people like the people that were planting and stuff didn't know the difference between them. So it was, it turned, it it's tended messy. to be messy. Even with our compost, we still sometimes get weed seeds that survive through the compost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, it's just um, it's just part of it. And, and we, then don't, we don't have help, so we don't have to worry. <laughs> when Jenny asked about um, the containers, we use a lot of peat pots, or we also um, save our... We, we, have, we mostly, 75% of ours are grown in 48 count flats. Um, you know, I've tried the different ones you can buy, like the, the ones with the water underneath, and I don't really like those. I think it keeps it too wet. Yeah. Um, but you gotta, you, you gotta watch your moisture with your seedlings. Um, you know, it's better to let them dry out a bit before you water them again. Um, you know, if you're starting them inside, you can put a cover on them or something to get them to germinate a little better, hold that moisture in. I just um, use plastic. One thing that works really, really well is bottom heat. We have, we have heat mats even in our greenhouse that we start to, especially like peppers that are hard to germinate, we'll put heat mats under them and it brings that soil temperature up even if the air temperature, because your air temperature has got to be 15 degrees above where you want your soil temperature for germination. Well, peppers want it 75 degrees before they germinate. That means your air temperature has got to be 90 degrees. Well, <laughs> you know, so if you put that bottom heat on it, you don't have to heat the air as much. If you're doing just a few plants for, for your home garden, just what I'll do, because I germinate my, I'll start like 150 pepper plants in a tray and then transplant them into four inch pots, but you could just as easily start them in the four inch pot and uh, just keep them in there until you're ready to transplant. Now if you want to put them, start them in the trays when they get up and they start getting their second leaves, second set of leaves, that's generally we'll put them into a three or four inch pot at that point because they're, they're packed so tight in those little, you know, the tray is about the size of the top of this stand here and we'll just do like four or five rows in each tray and just get them started and then we transplant them into pots from there. And yeah. like, but like they just got two little seed leaves. leaves, they're actually pretty hardy. You can pluck them right yeah, out. We That's trays. how most commercial greenhouses actually grow them like that because, yeah. you know, when you go to the store, you wonder, how did they get all of them to Germany? Well, they didn't. They stuck them in there. That's not where they actually were originally planted. Well, if you're handling little transplants, mm -hmm. hold them by that first seed leaf because you're not going to hurt that. That's going to fall off anyway because they will bruise. And I mean, they're, if you they're pinch them too hard, delicate. Mm -hmm. So delicate, but yet. But they're, they're amazingly <laughs> you know, they'll take off. But. And the, what Mark said about heat, we found to be true too. We have a in, we have a boiler room where our heat exchanger is, and that's where I germinate my peppers. It's because it's we don't even there. Use, we don't even worry about light at that point. No, until they come up. Yeah, oh. because we we put them where it's warm, very hot. And sh we'll, we don't buy the plastic yeah. covers. We just use saran wrap. Most seeds do not require top. light to germinate, but there are some. Lettuce requires light to germinate. Yeah. Some uh, flowers. So, um, yeah, some. Uh, there's more flowers than vegetables that require it, but lettuce is one vegetable that does it, similar to grass seed, and so they generally just don't get planted as deeply in the, in the medium. But they, they require some light. But I found that natural light is good enough for their germination. But th then you can hit, the, you know, put the light on them, you know, after they germinate, you know, anything. I think we had a question. Did you have a question? Yeah, um, I'm curious what you do uh, when you're starting with a clay soil. I have 10 acres of clay that <laughs> you know, kills me. I mean, I've planted hundreds of trees and I have to jump up and down on my spade shovel 800 times to dig a hole. Try and get as much organic I have been. I go down to the city and I shovel my truck full of compost. Yep. And one year I went and got old cow manure. Yep. I got a truck full of that. Oh my God. I had nothing but weeds. Yep. I, had a, I couldn't even tell where my plants were. And really, you know what? Weeds are not all bad. Always all bad. 
because no. Well, a prime example, last year... If they year, don't go to seed, we had, they're really not a problem. Okay. We had probably about four acres of gardens last year, and in between chickens and everything else that were going, one of our gardens, the weeds got away on us. And they went from like this to like this. That's what I... I mean, I would yeah. literally fall on my butt so, when I would get it out of the ground. I would so pull it so hard, I'd end up on the butt. What you can do before you plant, say like in May, uh, cover that with black visqueen. Black after you sweet. after you uh, spread, spread your manure and cook them and and just okay, well, let I that sun just cook that okay right through that black it'll plastic kill, and it'll, it'll, it'll kill, kill a good percentage how, of those weeds how big of an area are you talking about okay right. well i i'm still really trying hard i did raise beds last year i had a lot more luck i just kind there of forgot <laughs> about my yeah. cow That's pile over there but yeah. now then i had dirt brought in it was supposed to be um, four yards. It was probably 20 yards. They made a huge mistake. Uh, <laughs> gravel. I'm so excited. Like I have this huge oh. black, it's awesome. So I have that and then I tilled like this ginormous area and I collected leaves from everybody that was, okay, but I didn't get a chance to go over them and mow them all up and then put them in and till them in. But I do have like this ginormous garden till. It's been tilled, like I tilled it down and back and sideways about you're, 10 times. You're definitely gonna to wanna to check your pH too. I know, and I, I got a kit and I, oh my God, I had just a nightmare last year trying to check the pH. I don't know, it was just this cheap little kit. <laughs> I think I need something better because <laughs> when you mix the clay up in the water, I didn't get any color that matched what. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I'm just like, hmm. I didn't know what my pH was. Now on our farm, the clay soils have been pretty consistent, running about 5.5. 5.5? That's pretty, that's like a ballpark. Okay. Um, and actually we have one garden that's hard clay, and it's one of the, clay is highly fertile soil, and it you won't have to amend it every year because it, it's got its own natural fertility. Oh, There's good it, things it, about it kills clay. My, it like stuff, it's so hard. The best my thing seedlings, it like you know, it's in lumps like this. Yeah. Well, and you put it on there, and it's just like half of your seedling, the roots gone. are uncovered, and the other half is a boulder laying on <laughs> it. That will help that. And it, we did it by accident. Okay. We, we had a bunch of brown bales that weren't back in the days when we had tons of hay right. that weren't the best, and we didn't feed them out, and so we just. Well, first we ran pigs through there for two We ran seasons. pigs through there for a couple of years because pigs. Oh, uh, pigs are perfect. Pigs are good. <laughs> yeah. But we just let that, let that mm -hmm. hay rot down on top of the clay. Okay. So, so I have some rotted hay that we were using to shoot just, target bow into last <laughs> yeah, year. Yeah, that'd be so great. That'll be great by this spring. Right? And you, if you got some of that rotted hay, some of your plants, I mean, if your garden well, is Well, I have 10 isn't, acres isn't of hay, this? actually, right now, basically 10 acres of hay that's yeah. all down from yeah. the snow. It's but I was going to say, if you have hay laying around, I have four huge bales of it. Yeah, what you can do is when you put your transplants in, if you okay. if you don't have time to get the visqueen on and all that, okay, and you don't have a humongous garden, you can just take some of that hay after you put your transplants in and put it about that deep around each plant. Okay, and that will at least help suppress the weeds immediately around, the around plant. that plant. And you can okay. even put it and if you got a little mantis tiller or something like that. And if you've got okay. lots of hay. Just well, I have. I don't cut it. it usually, I just it, I let it grow. It gets taller than me, and I just like watching it blow in the wind. But now, see, last year um, I started on that. Bale hay. Oh, bale yeah. hay! No, I don't bale have hay. bale hay. As well, a general. No, I, think I would I would watch the the hay as far as the um, soil temperature though too. It's going to keep it gets soil so hot. Yeah. Okay. Well, it gets cold. It, okay. it actually keeps it cold. Yeah. It does. It keeps yeah. it cold. Yeah, but but you're not going to transplant it, your plants into the soil. Right. So okay. it, it also depends on what transplant you're putting it around too. If you're putting it around a broccoli transplant, it's going to go thank you, you know. <laughs> so it, it does. It, that makes a difference. As far as the the porousness of the soil, there are other things you can do too. Um, if you add lime, like the Agran makes a liquid lime that's really easy yeah. to apply, and it's a calcitic lime. And you guys sell these products, yeah. correct? I yeah. need to come and see you guys. Yeah. Um, you can cover crop. If, if you have a yeah, I've read that too. It works yeah. really well. Yeah. You can do that too, and you know even they they're using oilseed radishes. They call them tillage radishes now too. That that are used as a cover crop too. Cover crops are hard to do around here because we don't have that extra season to grow the cover crop like exactly. they do other places. That's why, um, yeah. Yeah, but there, you know, you if you add um, 
a good line that actually will aerate the soil yeah. too. Bridge. Can um, you till that in with? You, or you just sprinkle it down? Well, if, if you're using a, a, a solid, yeah. Oh, you're, you're, oh, you use the liquid. But if you use a liquid, you can just uh, You just water just it onto yeah, your yeah, garden? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But um, any kind of natural type fertilizers also have the same effect as the compost, but anything mm -hmm. organic like that that you can get into a clay soil is going to help with its um, the aeration of the soil. Okay. It's not that you're necessarily wanting to increase the fertility, you're wanting to increase the drainage yeah. and that type of thing. And raised beds, you're on to something. You got to use the raised beds with the nice loose soil. Okay, you know? we, we plant you everything in raised beds clay. now. Um, I, right, we so? use a raised bed maker band a tractor and uh -huh. make all of our raised beds but and plant clay. them right in there. Oh, you, it's mean, all clay. you mean the mounds? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, because I have built, you okay. know, yeah, we, we yes. mound our soil so it's loose and soil in to it, no it, clay. There's no clay in my raised beds. Okay, well, but ours are solid clay, but garden. they're they're raised up. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And it makes, the makes a big difference. Right. Yeah. Okay. What we do also, we cheat sometimes and make your rows uh -huh. and then take your black dirt that they gave you 10 extra yards or whatever and have someone come with a tractor and go down your rows and just however you want to space your plants. Uh huh. Blob of black dirt there. Yeah. Just oh. You know. yeah. And then and obviously then it stays there, it. but that's you're kind of okay. utilizing it right then rather than right. spreading it on this whole area that you're really right. not planting. It's a way to gotcha. apply it, but it you're makes kind it go of, further too. Yeah, it's like right. treating it. <laughs> well, not only goes further, but you're not feeding the weeds in between the plants. <laughs> there you go. Right. And they, right. A lot of people say, well, you got to add sand. Don't. Don't add. Food. I tried that too. Yeah. I tried everything. It, it actually <laughs> makes a brick. Ago, <laughs> you know, unless you can add enough sand that it makes a sandy soil, all you're making is a clay brick. I made like a mess. Yeah. <laughs> they actually say that if you're gonna uh, put something inorganic like that in uh -huh. it, you're better off with pea gravel. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. That you would just put pea gravel out, uh, vermiculite. I if just I could wanted get to get the soil from they, clumping. They say that's the best blow away thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you got to it in. But you know, because you can still run it till you work it, but it. It gives you more air space in your okay. soil. Okay. Yeah. And you had a question? Do either of you have a um, asparagus patch? And what kind would you plant up here? And how do you prep the? <laughs> <laughs> we have tried asparagus. Well, we're going to try again this year too. Yeah, I have uh, We have tried a few times. Uh, we we ran across a great deal. We got bags of crowns for free. And, uh, so we were like, wow, we jumped on that, you know, and we planned them and we waited. Nothing this year, nothing next year. Three of them came out. They all died. Mm -hmm. and, um, so this year we're going to try seed. A friend of ours out in Rudyard that has a really nice asparagus patch. She says, I have so much better luck with seeds. And I said, okay, you talked us into it. We're going to try seeds this year and Not see how wait it goes. So seeds instead of crowns? That, that yep. Actually, they've got seeds at uh, the Cookford Feed Service. <laughs> You can get a pretty good packet of them for a dollar. So, it's, and it's Mary Washington. It's an old heirloom variety. Um, at the farmers market, um, there's a few of the vendors that that have asparagus. Asparagus. Part of our big problem with asparagus too is that we get so busy that we slack on the weeds. And yeah. asparagus is a spring crop. And then when you're done with it and you've got all this other stuff going yeah. on, we tend to goof up on that but it's it is sensitive to weeds I need especially at first <laughs> um the purple asparagus <laughs> yeah the purple asparagus is really good um i know I some folks that come to the farmer's market from out by trout lake they grow to purple and the green and they grow it's fantastic stuff and um yeah we just not had we just look. moved to our new place where we're at now last year and so I mean there wasn't a single garden there before we moved there so we had to do everything last spring from scratch after we had lived at our old place for so long and we also started seeds last year for asparagus and we transplanted them last fall but that's as far as we've gotten but yeah it's a lot like onions because it doesn't have a canopy right it's very sensitive to weed growth yeah. and it has a lot of weed growth they won't it can't out compete weeds like some other things can yeah. Yeah. but yeah what amazes me is how much wild stuff i see growing I around places like, that, 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 they say, say it doesn't say, there's wild to grow. asparagus that's growing just yeah. a few miles from my house it's insane like it's 
Yeah. Now, crazy everywhere. If you could get a hold of some of those crowds, I know, I think I'll go down, down and get some. Yeah. 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 Well, I know people. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. Yeah. So after you've started your, um, like your ceiling inside the house with, your, with the heating mats and that, um, how warm do you want that soil to stay? It's like, it does it, I mean, once they've germinated, are they okay to cool down a bit? Yes. Or, I mean, like, and how cold is too cold? Like, when my basement gets a little cooler down there, it's like, I'd say, like, maybe 65. Is that too oh, cool? Yeah. They or actually that? prefer a little cooler to okay. grow. It, and okay. it's, you're not going to get the rampant growth, and I think they're a little hardier if they're grown under cool conditions once they're going. Okay. You know? Yeah. Okay. And I was going to finish on the weeds too, the patch of weeds that got away from us. I started weeding some of that. I got a little extra time. I started weeding it with the drought that we've had last year and a few years before. I learned a valuable lesson that weeds are not all that bad because that, or I weeded that one little section, all of our cabbage and cauliflower plants died because it was so hot. We don't dry. irrigate. We don't irrigate. And yeah, we don't, right. And we don't have drip irrigation or anything. We don't have a way to water we all of our <coughs> count on sky water and um, so I didn't get around to the other ones till later and they were starting to uh, cauliflower was starting to make heads um, the cabbages were making heads great. and it's like man we've got to get on this you know well what amazed me was how moist the soil was around the bottom of those weeds now yes we had aphids on the on the lambs quarters and there were other issues you know but so at times I don't think weeds were that bad, and not be for a drought year, I, I wish I had a market for lambs quarters because I had lambs quarters this tall, and I've never seen anything like it before. I've got uh, some seedlings, apple seedlings, down in the basement underneath some uh, fluorescent lights, warm and, and cold fluorescent lights. Uh, but I'm having some problems with uh, powdered mildew. Uh, are they doomed, or if I transplant them, harden them off, and transplant them later on in the in late summer, early fall, are they going to survive? Or well, first I would that? say uh, you started these from seed. Yeah. Well, you're not going to get well, the apple. We're not worried about that so much. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I, I know that they don't come true to. Okay. To but the you seed, could but have some really interesting apples. Too. Yeah, they're more for you know for the wildlife. How big are they? Yeah, they're probably about eight inches or so. Wow. Okay. Yeah. I, I had them three months in the refrigerator doing a stratification on them and everything else and I put them in some worm castings and they germinated in the refrigerator and then I planted them into uh, a little uh, the seed tray and they're they're popping up pretty good but I'm getting a lot of uh, powdery mildew on them uh, and they seem much. healthy it's just they're coated with the lower leaves are coated with the white mildew it's a little too much moisture too damp down there maybe see, it doesn't see it's it is in my basement um I, and i'm just wondering if maybe it's the airflow or i or doubt what. that it has enough airflow that's yeah. you know, that it's it's not yeah. obviously outside mm -hmm. um, I, I guess my question well. is are those things a wash or if i get them out into uh, into my property later on will that mildew rectify itself or will it, it be a should, constant should. problem you know i would take a rag with some vinegar on it and wipe those leaves, the, the powdery mildew. Yeah, I've tried unless some, you got hundreds of them or something. Yeah, I've tried some store bought stuff, but it just doesn't stick to the leaves. And I've even uh, tried some skim milk, but it doesn't seem to stick good enough on it to cover it's it all. That's a good old Bragg's organic raw yeah. apple cider vinegar and, and and rub those leaves and get a fan on them. Yep. I think I would try to get some more air circulation in there. Get a fan or get them upstairs right where it's drier. Yeah. Uh, like I said, otherwise they seem pretty pretty healthy. I mean, and don't overwater them because you'll cause root rot if you overwater. Let them dry out before you water them. That's the biggest mistake most people make with plants and seedlings, mm -hmm. is giving them a little drink every day or every two days. <clears throat> Generally speaking, wait until they've dried out enough so the pot feels light and almost starting to wilt. Yeah. And then water them thoroughly until the water runs out the bottom of the pot. Don't let them sit in a tray of water and then Wait until they dry down real good again, and they'll be tougher too if you let them do they that. They call that damping off. Yeah, right if you overwater. And like I said, they're, they're doing pretty well. I just didn't know <coughs> all my uh, work is for nothing, and I'm going to get them outside, and they're going to continue to be coated with white mildew all year. Well, the sun will most likely, once you get them out, the sun will most likely take care of that powdered mildew. Okay. Sunshine the sun is, is a great sanitizer. Yeah. Even um, 
I mean, this is off subject, but we were at a meeting once about bird flu, and they were talking about how we had to lock our chickens up and put screens on the windows and keep any wild birds out and all this. And then they talked about the things that kill uh, the bird flu. The virus. The virus. And they said sunshine kills it on contact. And I'm like, hello, did you hear what you said? <laughs> no, no. But so that's an example of sunshine being a very good uh, disinfectant. Light of hope, hope then. How many of you grow plants in, like for tomatoes or peppers, in a large container? You know, the common thing in the fridge box. Does it, does it have pretty good luck with it, or do you have? Yeah. You know, no. <laughs> you mean like a pot? <laughs> Some people grow yeah. container tomatoes. I, I bought container tomatoes and grew the ones that were already potted on the porch, but my ones in my, what I call a raised bed was no clay, with just soil that I added, yeah. they were happy. Right. Sometimes people, you were talking about watering, and uh, you think about making your coffee. when. You know, you put the coffee grounds in the thing and then it shoots water through them and that stuff is percolated or leached off of the coffee into that's kind of what happens when you water something in a container. It the, when it pours out the bottom, there your nutrients go out. Pour out the bottom yeah. Of the yeah. Um I, what I try to do is water it a little and then let it set, go back and water it you know, during a watering session until it finally just barely starts to come out to because a lot of the, the potting soil is peat moss based and it has to expand like a sponge mm -hmm. so if you dump a bunch of water in right at first when it's dry mm -hmm. it'll just run right through it i noticed that i use hot water but usually when i first get yeah, in my but i found a lot of people have uh, uh blossom end rot in their tomatoes and containers mm -hmm. because they leach their calcium out mm -hmm. you know um stuff like that eggshells yeah. um you know so you know, just be aware of that, that if that's happening where you're watering and it's coming out, that you may, you're may you going to be losing nutrients too. So. You can feed potted plants with compost tea. Yeah. Um, you have some yeah. good soluble yeah. fertilizers. Um, even just make manure tea. If you have manure, you can take a five gallon bucket, put about that much composted manure in it, fill it up with water, just stir it up good, let it sit for a solid. couple days. And use that water. Just keep it separate it from your iced tea. <laughs> <laughs> this is kind of gross, but I, mean, uh, I actually kind of go behind the chicken sometime. I have a special spoon <laughs> to keep out the shed, you know, so it doesn't get mixed up with anything else. But uh, and I'll actually pick up a few droppings, put it in a gallon jug of water, and fill it up, shake it up real good, and let it sit in the sun for two or three days, and it makes the best uh, compound mm -hmm. manure tea. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was going to say, I haven't, grown, I haven't grown much up here yet because I'm new, but I haven't grown squash and I was just curious what the squash bugs are like up here because they were my nemesis for the last eight years, so I was just looking. Where were you gardening before? Paducah and then Savannah, Georgia. Oh, okay. We and don't every have morning I was so out there. But, I mean, they, there would come a point where I would just let go. I don't I'm think I've ever had a squash beetle. We've oh, never seen a uh, uh, squash beetle. Not bad word. Yeah. <laughs> the, the cucumber beetles last year, the spotted yeah, and yeah. the striped were the striped uh, behind us. And we were gardening in somewhere where we've never gardened before. Okay. And we had, even in the fall when I was plowing, there were like zucchinis laying in the ground that had been left there. And they, I have pictures of it, they were covered in thousands of them. Oh my goodness. And they were all in our sunflowers. Our sunflowers were just coated with cucumber beetles. I don't know where the cucumber beetles were. It was unbelievable. And so, you know, they didn't hurt too much. Um, you know, they, every single blossom. You can picture, you know, how many, you know, squash plants, pumpkins or winter squash or summer squash, you know. Well, they would move on to that cucumbers. Yeah. Yeah. And, I mean, and then eventually they'd be on my beans. And I'm like, what are you doing? <laughs> you know. Well, honestly, we haven't seen it. The, the squash, I know that's a very uh, tough insect to, yeah. to get rid of. You know, you're cutting the, the slit in the plant. Oh, open out there every morning, stuff, but, shaking them into buckets yeah. of soapy water. <laughs> but, yeah, the cucumber beetles were terrible. I don't know. Why? And it was so I, hot and dry. I, the insects were worse yeah. last year here than normal. Usually, okay. they aren't too bad. 
You had, you had a question? Yeah, I did. All right. I, uh, there's some companion plants too, I think, that help out with those. I like to plant chives around my apple trees. But what I was wanting to ask is the, um, the tea, the compost tea that you guys are talking about, do you guys have to aerate that or uh, to, you know, to stimulate the microorganism growth like you do with like worm castings or anything like that? Or do you just- It wouldn't hurt. It, it, it would, would be okay. Yeah, right? and just pour it, you just take the compost and mix yeah. it up and just yeah. pour it straight from but there. It, but it's not gonna hurt, you know. Yeah. You have I to have to jump in. Well, plants my have, mom makes tea. Well, she plants have like immune systems. We, we just like compost, because we have so much, we use all of our bedding, which yeah. is really not bedding, it's it's just the hay that the sheep yeah. don't eat. We clean all that out and make big compost piles, and I just keep turning yeah. with the tractor. Yeah. And uh, that's basically how we make ours. Yeah. yeah. Just. I have like four or 5,000 worms, and the, the worm castings, mm -hmm. you know, that's recommended your area and you put maple syrup in there and, you know, mm -hmm. get the microorganisms to, to actually uh, mm -hmm. uh, reproduce and stimulate the, the plant growth a little bit better than just straight leaching out the sure. tea. Yeah. So I didn't know about the same. Well, maple syrup is going to have minerals in it that uh, uh, are not available to your regular garden plants. Mm -hmm. Because of the taproot of the maple tree it goes way down into the ground, and with the rain we get, what Mark was talking about, <coughs> you know, of minerals, uh, and that happens here too. That's the reason we live in iodine and uh, selenium deficient area, uh, because what so little is here gets leached out with the amount of rainfall we have every year. With the with like the manure too, does it matter which type of animal that it comes from? And it's like, and then is like one year long enough for it to be composted, or how long does it take? Well, sheep and goats uh, pass very few wheat seeds uh, through their digestive system. Cows, wheat seeds can get through their digestive system, so you'd want to compost uh, any of your cow manure hot. before you. Uh, uh, chicken manure is very hot. It should be composted yeah. too. But there's very the little that gets through a chicken's digestive system either. And there will be no weed seeds. I think the anything. ideal setup is really to have, if you have access to more than one type of manure, mm -hmm. to mix them all together. Um, there are differences in the actual test there are. of the nitrogen, you know, that Phosphorus, type of thing. But potassium. It, they're somewhat subtle if you know, for for an average gardener, um, you know, I wouldn't worry. To, you know, you, you get your source, and you and you really all of them. If you compost, it's really better because the nutrients are more available. Okay. okay. Now, when we used to garden just just for ourselves, we used to just have about a hundred by a seventy-five foot, hundred foot long wide by seventy-five feet long mm -hmm. garden, and that would give us. We had three, and it would feed three of us for the winter out of that small of the garden. Mm -hmm. So you don't need a huge area. Mm -hmm. Okay. The last couple of years, I've had real nice zucchini plants, and they make lots of blossoms, but I don't get very many zucchini. And sometimes they'll rot on the ends after they have. That's also a water circulation, air circulation problem there, and too, with, with the blossom, blossom end rot. rot. Yeah. Uh, the not producing uh, pollination. Well, yeah. there's a problem with pollination yeah. anymore. Um, oh, we've gone to some of our summer squash varieties are parthenocarpic. Mm -hmm. They can they self fertilize, so they don't need to be fertilized by a bee. But there are issues with pollination. The bees aren't what they used to be. Plus, they can the activity of bees is affected by temperature too. So you know, yeah. If you have you know. Think about your moisture. Also think about pollination. Um, you know, you can pollinate them yourself. If you just got a With few plants. With a brush, a little yeah. brush. And the more flowers and variety of flowers you have around your farm, and they even recommend around the edges of your lawn letting wildflowers and stuff grow because it attracts the wild pollinators. And uh, because bumblebees, mason bees, there's a lot of different, even butterflies and houseflies will, will even pollinate the your plants. Will pollinate. Even hummingbirds Does will it, pollinate. Does everybody plants. know the difference between a male flower and a female flower, for example, on a zucchini plant? Uh -huh. The male flowers have a long stem with no bulb under the, the flower. That's a male. The females always have a little small fruit, whatever it is, a zucchini or pumpkin. They always have a little bulge and they tend to be shorter. So you want, you want to, the males are, you know, I've even just taken a, cut off a male 
no. things. <laughs> Stick it in there. Oh, to be a bee. To be, you know, quick and dirty. <laughs> but, yeah, so that's, you know, you can do that, so especially if you just have a few plans, you know, that will help. Be a bee. Yeah. And there weren't very many early in the season when most stuff was blooming last year, it was so dry that we didn't have as many insects as usual in uh, well, the good insects. The good ones. Mm -hmm. Well, and even mosquitoes, like I said, it, yeah. um, you know, mosquitoes and black flies even do some pollination. Mm -hmm. um, I don't we know what the frogs looked on last year. Yeah, but there really weren't very many insects because of the drought last year. So that may have contributed to the problem. She had a question. Um, I am hopefully once it thaws remodeling my garden a bit uh, right now I have three four by four squares in the backyard nothing major but we're gonna put four um, four by eight raised beds in but my question is um, I've seen a lot like I do a lot of research on the internet and stuff particularly on gardening forums and some of them say to just use compost and like maybe some peat moss because our clay is, or our soil is very clayey so they say to just use that, but should I get a hold of maybe Gregory Gardens and bring dirt in as well? Or should I just try to fill those up with compost and peat moss? Like how should I com you know, compose my soil in those beds? How deep are they going to be? Um, maybe 16 inches? Yeah. Well, your soil, your plants are only gonna use about the top six inches of soil then. Okay. Uh, most most plants um, so I would say go ahead and use black dirt or topsoil in the bottom foot okay um, and, and I've seen a lot of people do like sit do I mean I don't know if you guys do any raised beds but um, yeah. we, we were thinking about using cedar but then people say that it doesn't last very long but um, I mean what would you recommend as far as Cedar's going to last longer than most of the other lumber. Uh, or tamarack. Tamarack. And your redwood is good, but also more expensive. Yep. Yeah. And yeah, cedar you local. can get local. Mm -hmm. um, if you're using like cedar six by sixes, it's going to be quite a few years before okay. those would go. And you know, the, the footprint is bringing in redwood from Colorado <laughs> yeah, compared to replacing <laughs> <laughs> Cal Colorado, Colorado yeah. California, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, okay. When you can get local untreated stuff, and I you wouldn't probably even go to a saw. Oh no, 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 no! Sawmill. I no, I no pressure treated wood yeah. mm -hmm. for gardens. So, cool. yes. Do you do crop rotation? Always. How does how does it work with your with what you plant? Well, we just try really hard to rotate. We have several gardens. I, we're really lucky on our farm because we have some of it, some sand, some clay, some loam. Um, so we just try to move, at least move plants, don't plant things in the same place year after year. <coughs> we have a small garden, sometimes that can be tricky, but if you planted tomatoes on this side next year, put them over here and put cabbages or something completely unrelated to. There's to some tomatoes. pretty good charts available on yeah. how to what to follow what with. Yeah, where? Um, Dale.org. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, they, they would have a lot of information for you. I was wondering, a couple people mentioned the, or a couple times mentioned the worm casing. Has anyone done worm composting? Like put them in a bin and. Verma composting. Verma composting. Yeah. I don't have any experience with it. I've seen some really neat, uh, Melanie Greenfield at Pickford has this really neat little, it's just a little compartment that little plastic box keeps like red worms in and she just puts her kitchen waste in the top and, and in the bottom, the bottom drawer she pulls it out and it's really nice worm castings and she just puts them in her garden but mm -hmm. they're a good fertilizer. Yeah. I'm trying to think of if, if you want to, yeah, from what I've read, because I've never done inside or anything like that, but um, it, it really can, it really is a good way to, to do it. 
I bet you could probably find something out about it on the internet. Melanie, Melanie Greenfield. Is she the one who was working with the um, seed exchange? No, she's MSU. Uh, Melanie also has been involved in the farmer's market in Pictures. <coughs> Friends of the library. library. And, uh, but she bought, it, it's, it's just, it looks just like a little plastic box that's about this tall and has like six or eight trays that she raises these red worms in. One thing that we've always done too, we, we, we used to have more time to fish. Um, I would always bring my crawlers, whatever crawlers I had left over, and just throw them out in the garden. Yeah. We've got and, a good uh, crop of worms then. Mm -hmm. oh, and so. now, after the, I mean, after all these years of doing this, you know, it's amazing to me after the rain how many crawlers I have in my garden now. Then, of course, you never see them until it rains. But, in our in our compost piles, um, we used to at our old place, we our chickens were free, completely free range, and. Um, they would actually dig at the pile. If you dug into that pile, it would just be full of red worms. Not, you know, so you find crawlers, but it was full of red worms. And they would dig it out to eat the worms. And they would spread the pile all the way out flat. And then as soon as they did that, I'd pile it back up and they would compost within a couple months. And it was pretty amazing how fast it would work. And unfortunately, we, ours are in a paddock now. <laughs> and they, they, they do have their own pile in there that they're working on, but they don't get to be out where the other piles are. I really miss that because they compost the stuff so fast. Yeah. Now, we know an elderly lady downstate, and what she did, she raised sheep, but and uh, she took the bedding from the sheep barn and piled it in a big pile, took some hog panels and put a couple little pigs in there, and they rooted out all around, flattened it up, piled it up, flattened it up, piled it up, and <laughs> it did it all for her. <laughs> and then at the end of the season, she had a great big huge pile that just blacked her. It was, yeah. looked like it. And she had pork meat, too. <laughs> <laughs> I, I compost with worms that I was gone at it. Yeah, so um, the oh, question yeah, about the red worms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, these red wickers. Yeah. Are you, do you have yours inside or what is it? They're in, they're in my garage right now, but I have it in a pretty deep box. I have it in a fiberglass box. Mm -hmm. and it's probably about that deep and that wide. And I got a lot of, they had a lot of dirt in there and a lot of, uh, I put some leaves and some grass in there and then I put some cardboard on top because to, the leaves and the grass and it, it decomposes and generates a little bit of its own heat. Mm -hmm. My garage stays pretty warm. Not, I mean, it's been below freeze a few times, but they burrow down pretty well. But they, they do pretty good on the food scrap, coffee grounds, coffee food. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta feed your worms, right? Yeah. <laughs> I shred a lot of cardboard too and put it in there and that works they, great. They eat, they'll eat cardboard yeah. up and they love it. They eat it all up and then <laughs> nice black yeah. dirt. Yeah, I've, uh, um, I think it's a good way to go for somebody that even in, in town you can do it. The only problem I have is during the summertime whenever I have it outside, you get a lot of mites. But, you know, as long as you don't Let's worry about it, it's not that big of a deal. The mites won't cause any problems. They'll Put a cat on a leash tied to your worm <laughs> compost box. <laughs> <laughs> yes. My, yeah, my sister had one of those black boxes, like you're talking about. Okay. She had it right in her kitchen. Yeah. And it never smelled. Yeah. I was always amazed that mm -hmm. oh, she could pull that drawer out and it was just sifted, sifted. Oh, it's beautiful mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. I was really yeah. impressed when I saw my, that. My Christmas cactuses love that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> All that. I just use Rubbermaid container. It's like my husband just drilled a bunch of holes in the top part of it. It's like, and that worked for us. Mm -hmm. Where do people get worms to start that? It's kind of like an ant farm, then. It's clear. You can get them online. Yeah, I think I got a couple gems. I was a fat couple gems, yeah. I think that, uh, I don't know how many of you get that. Is that called Tomatoes Plus or Only Tomatoes? That one little catalog that well, there's like totally tomatoes. Totally, yeah, totally tomatoes. tomatoes. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> they, I don't know if any of you get that, but I think they sell uh, red worm castings or not castings, but uh, red worms. Yes. Red worms. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And if you order one seed catalog, you'll be blessed with one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Which is nice because then you can. It's oh, great. Right. A day like today, when to, you know tomorrow is the first day of spring and it's snowing. <laughs> it's kind of nice to go through your seed catalogs. And but you better be careful. You'll, garden. Go, 
you will go out of your budget real quick. Yeah. <laughs> now seeds are getting expensive. I don't yeah. know if anybody's noticed the yeah. price increases on things. Yeah. A lot of seeds are growing. But, but, but this time of the year, you know, when you're looking at all the pretty yeah. pictures, it's like, oh, I want that. I want that. Aside, aside from you know doing your composting and, and tilling the soil, what do you guys do for pest control when you're not using pesticides and you have your aphids and, and whatnot? What do you guys do? To I never home? do anything for aphids because I found that pretty shortly after an aphid outbreak you're going to have a bunch yeah, of that only takes like eight or nine days and they're already come in and already um, get rid of the ants the only in, okay. in, insect that we really have do any treatment for at all is cabbage loopers and that's only if they're really bad and we'll spray a little BT okay. but I'm real I don't even trust that, that much. anything like that. So if you do end up with a, a problem, then you just kind of let that plant go. And yep. And a lot of times, I mean, I you're not going to get everything every year. Right. It a lot of times you'll have one pest one year, and it, it's as much weather and condition related as it is anything. Mm -hmm. But the, the loopers are pretty. They're persistent. They're just yes. about every year. They're pretty. We, uh, when we transplant ours, we put cardboard collars and wood ashes uh, around the base, probably six to eight inches out from each plant. Yeah. Uh, we sprinkle wood ashes because they don't like to crawl across the Do you guys worms. know what, um, the, uh, on the cabbage worms, what lays the eggs? The little, white, the little butterflies little white butterflies that you see fly, flittering around? Fluttering Those around. are laying your eggs that you get your green worms from. Yeah. And well, we, we struggle with them because with a lot of what we do with our produce, the produce has to look pretty good, um, you know, um, through the CSA and also. So, you know, the, the worms are, are a struggle because they can really damage an entire crop pretty quick. People um, get freaked out if they buy a broccoli and it's kind yeah. of <laughs> My mom runs around her garden with a butterfly net and catches all the little butterflies. <laughs> <laughs> if you have little children, that's a great job. Yeah. <laughs> but so, you know, sometimes we can look out that window at, over top of like the cabbage crop, and it's like a it's like a mosquito swarm, a white butterfly, just the whole whole. Then we have a heart attack. <laughs> well, that's a good job for children. Don't get yeah. a butterfly. Or, They're a tough one. In a small area, now we can't use them in our place without, <laughs> it is row crop, or, or row covers. Row covers, yes. Um, really work well to exclude a lot of pests. You know, it's a mechanical or a physical barrier. You, have, you don't have to use any chemicals, and there's not a whole lot that can get through it. The, the keys are to do it so that plants can still get pollinated if they need pollinating that you're not making too much heat under that like use lightweight ones if you're you know putting it over cabbage or something like that because your cabbage doesn't want it hot mm -hmm. to exclude the butterflies they can't lay their eggs so they work really well no at our place it's windy and we have a huge area and, and between those two things it's hard to well use them but if you have a small mm -hmm. area you know like your your beds for example if you didn't want that where it was broccoli or something like that you know you could put a nice little row cover over that oh yeah i was thinking about putting like um, yeah. Uh, hollow, like, not, I don't know if so metal is going to work, poop. but posts so you can put yeah. PVC pipes mm -hmm. and yeah. you know. One simple other. row cover. Yeah. Like. One well, not even a plastic row cover. He's talking about the type of uh, uh, it's called it's, it's a it's a bree it's a breathable water can go through the fabric. Okay. Yeah, the plastic row covers will cook your plants yeah. if it's hot and sunny. Yeah. Oh gosh, I won't use them if it's hot. But um, I have a hard enough time getting things pollinated. But that, the, it, they call it Agrabond. You can usually find. I think. Yeah, you there's different it. weights of it too. Yeah, but um, there's frost blankets and then yeah, there's yeah. the lightweight summer yeah. stuff. Um, one other thing you can do, because eventually you're going to have a cabbage looper or two in your pole crops, in your cabbage or your broccoli or your cauliflower, and this is something that I do, is I have a big tank of real cold water, and right after I harvest them, I put them in that cold water and generally if you leave it in there for like 15 minutes they'll float out and they won't be continuing to eat in your refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> chickens, um, they, they're just like little gummy worms. Chickens, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, one other pest that we do sometimes have trouble with if we plant an early crop of real early broccoli or early cabbage is uh, root maggots. And what, what those look like is you'll have all these beautiful little broccoli and cabbage plants that are just perfect and then you go out to the garden the next day and they're all wilted. Mm -hmm. And you pull them Some up. Some of them will actually fall over even. You, they'll mm -hmm. pull right out of the ground and all the roots will be eaten off and you'll sometimes see a little maggot in the roots and those are laid by white flies. Eggs mm -hmm. laid by white flies. Um, you can use the remake covers yeah, for them, them. But generally what we do is we just plant later. Mm -hmm. I usually don't put my cold crops in until the third week of June or so because I have a real, I, I, every year I try a few and usually count on losing about half. Of them. And my mom it struggles with yep. her maggots but and she's in Cedarville. We're, we're, we don't, I haven't really seen that up yeah. there, but, um, so I don't, you know, but yeah. she, Oh, in our long, it's in our long yeah. we have one garden yeah. that's long we saw but, yeah uh, it's, no, it's if, worse there if you yeah. cover with one of those remay row covers so the white flies can't lay their eggs next to the plant or use a paper uh, they even make these things called cabbage collars it's just a little disc that's impregnated with a little copper to keep slugs off of them and uh, for a small garden that's really an ideal thing but it also keeps the flies from laying their eggs at the base of the plant because that's what they do is they lay the egg at the base of the plant and then the little maggot hatches and climbs down and eats the roots but that's really now we learn about i learned about <coughs> potatoes from she listens to a show every week over on the cdc radio at lawrence he's a horticulturist or organic horticulturist and he was the one i was listening to him one day and he, he has a gardening said, call in show on mondays at um usually between 12 30 and 12 45. Uh, call -ins. And he was the one that said, wait until up here in this part of the country, wait until after the 4th of July to plant your potatoes. <laughs> and, uh, and a lot of folks said, well, you'll have small potatoes. Well, I had white potatoes this big around last year. So. Oh. The only ones that really require a long season There's potatoes is russets. the russets. And you can't really plant, you'll end up with small russets. And if you have clay soil, russets don't generally do right. that great either, but all the red and white potatoes, yellows, the golds. Well. We're actually looking at um, uh, Cedarville, the uh, high school that has been in contact with us, and they're wanting to purchase initially 400 potatoes for their food service from us. <coughs> so that's kind of neat. Yeah. yeah. That's great. Exactly. Did you have a question? Um, yeah, would, would you recommend the same methods for something that's like eating the seedlings that come up overnight? <coughs> Sounds like a metal bowl. That might be a little, <coughs> little hairy really? mouse looking. Yeah. It looks like a mouse and if they're coming in and they're just clipped off and there's just a little stem yeah. sticking up. Yeah. It sounds like a metal bowl. Metal bowls were really they're bad really last bad. year. Mm -hmm. yeah. I got a whole bunch of things that got eaten. Mostly yeah. carrots. Right down the little nut. Yeah. They got a lot of our peppers are some of our first pepper peppers <coughs> too. Yeah. They, they came right into the cold fresh. Yeah, they eat the like the beets. They would eat the top part that was just. It looks so pretty. Uh, and you go to yeah. 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 I grew these really weird cantaloupes last year that looked more like a winter squash than a cantaloupe. They're ribbed and kind of flattened. And I was so mad at the metal bowls because they go out and they change colors when they're ripe you know it's an easy one that's the reason i like it because <laughs> kind of loose watermelons are hard to tell sometimes when they're ripe yeah, at least for me yeah it's it's nothing more fun well anyway it's yeah. a, then getting to the end and then you pick it <laughs> so i go to pick the melon you know there's a nice about a seven pound cantaloupe nice big cantaloupe and look over the bottom and the metal holes oh. had gone through the bottom tunneled up to eat to oh. all the seeds oh. 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 That's why like, oh. <laughs> scare eyes do work for that. Um, you won't catch them with a regular mouse trap unless you use some. Some people corn. say corn. Huh. I haven't had luck with corn. Some people say apple slices because they're not a mouse. They they're won't go for peanut butter. They like look like a mouse. They look like a little mm -hmm. fat so mouse with a short to, like, tail. Trap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, baling hay last year. I mean, when oh, they we were raking or something, the the seagulls would be. I've never seen seagulls eat 
like oh, these things just just hold seagulls, you know, and you can see the thing just like, oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I've never seen anything like that. Yeah, we, yeah. we went to pick our hay up out of the You field. know, usually they're eating like the grubs and stuff behind your rake, but they were eating the whole, this whole metal Well, they even got into my cauliflower last yeah. year. I had these big, beautiful white heads of cauliflower and every so often one of them, they, and I've never had a problem like that before last year. And they ate, and I knew it was them because they pooped on it too. <laughs> 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 oh, I got a seven-pound head of cauliflower with part of it eaten. And those are hard to grow. My yes. Kids, my <laughs> cats. My cats like to hang out at the garden because they get all kinds yeah. of yes, bowls and screws. Yeah. Yeah. And those yeah. scare eyes do help. So, so okay, what, what's a scare? It's a balloon that looks like a big giant eye. <laughs> it's a mylar balloon, like yeah. you know, like the bird. But you have to move it around regularly. Don't just leave it in the okay. same place because they'll think after a while they'll get wise to it but if you move it and just different things like that that you can do besides traps that's like this year with the heavy metal bowl population we've got a friend that's a birder and uh and i told him i said i'll bet you we'll have great great owls this year in snowies oh yeah because of all the metal bowls so you know generally speaking whenever there's an overgrowth of one thing something else most times will come in and take care of your problem for you yeah usually usually when you have a big population like we did last year they'll have a crash too and they won't be so bad for a few years but they're cyclic and there's always some so do they come on at night is that yeah. what they yeah. okay they got in my cold frames and it looked like a little miniature ground ate about 100 that. pepper plants on me last they kind of if you saw one in a, in a passing and you would just think it's a mouse maybe or a deer or something so if it has a shorter it's tail and has hair on its tail where the mouse has a bigger tail okay do they shorter, dig tunnels a little bit yeah. lighter I had tunnels in my blueberries, and yep. just my berries were picked. Yep. Because it was the first year I planted them. I'm like stamping down these little tunnels and trails, animals, but they yeah. didn't eat the plant. They just picked the berries and left like a mess yep. along the way, and I, that must be what they were, because yep. I never saw what it was. There was a huge population of them. I mean, that was part of why the owl site, uh, the owls did really well last winter. All the birds of prey did, because they had all those bowls to oh. eat. But Huh. Hopefully they got most of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's where if you, you know, yeah. encouraging birds of prey. I have ravens. They're the biggest ravens I have ever seen. They're amazing. They're in my compost pile and they fight and they, oh, they're hilarious. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're better than TV any day of the week. establishing the breeding yeah. grounds right they're now. They're so funny, yeah. huh? So they're starting to establish their breeding so grounds right now. Is that what they're doing? Yep. Oh, so so God, I love the ravens. I saw sorry. Um, I was just wondering about the organic seeds. I'm seeing advertised more. Is there any real value to look for organic seeds versus ordinary seeds? I always buy organic seeds when I'm buying seeds <coughs> for something that they have a genetically modified crop that's already out on the market. Okay. Um, I try to support like the local feed mill and buy my seeds there. So Same. I. But I don't buy chard or beets or corn or uh, summer potato, squash. Potato seed. And potato seed. I buy organic. Um, I also think, too, that organic seeds probably are a little, they won't have, the plant the seed came from won't have been like chemically pushed mm -hmm. so that you probably have. A little better quality seed there if you're going to grow organically because um, seeds are sensitive we, to we also grass. noticed too that with some of our plants like especially our tomatoes and peppers that it seems like uh, especially with our tomatoes the few tomato plants we get that get leggy are almost always the hybrids mm -hmm. Where the open pollinated organic Organi heirloom we do buy types. all organic tomato seeds well we do buy one we do have a couple hybrids. We do have a couple hybrid varieties that I just I like just them and grown them for years. And, but they do tend but to. But hybrid is not GMO. That's it's totally yeah. different. What tomato do you guys like the best? My favorite tomato. Boy, that's hard. I grow like twenty five varieties. <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, I I'm torn. I get I grew a new one from uh, Baker Creek Heirloom Seeds two years ago called Orange Icicle. 
that I love. It's a paste tomato. It's a paste type tomato, but I also like uh, my tomato called Black Prince. It's a mahogany brown colored one with greenish seeds inside, and it's from mm -hmm. Siberia, and I always get those. But they're really super good flavored tomatoes. They can really good. And one of my favorites is, uh, in English, it's Malachite Box. It's a Russian tomato. It's a big, giant green tomato. Called Malakatoyashkatoka yeah. or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it's, they always make huge tomatoes. They're great slicers. They have, and they have wonderful flavor yeah. uh, for a large, for a full-size tomato. Uh, cherries, I like sun gold. That's my, they're the little orange ones, and they get almost a tangerine color when they're ripe. That's one of the best. Uh, I do like uh, Paul Robeson and uh, uh, Cherokee Purple, too, tomatoes for eating. They're a darker, uh, a very dark red type tomato. Thank you. Now, we grew orange watermelons last year, too, and that was a new one for us. You never heard of that. A few varieties of yeah, tomatoes. We even have our own. It's called Beaver Meadow Creek Brandy yeah. Wine. That it was a cross of a regular pink brandy wine with with an orange tomato. Um, and I would say it's probably in its sixth or seventh generation yeah. now. And and it's um, one thing about brandy wines because you'll see brandy wines advertised as the best tasting tomato. Blah blah blah. They're, they're fantastic, but they're a real long season tomato yeah. too. Um, yeah. So these actually are a little earlier because the orange tomato that they were crossed with was earlier and, and they're really neat they're pink and orange and all the way through and mm -hmm. they, they actually look very similar to some of the other ones that are out there <laughs> they're beautiful I've yeah seen them. <laughs> and they're, they're, and they're, and they're really big good tomatoes i too. myself personally i like more acidic tomatoes so um sometimes with heirlooms those there aren't as many that are more acidic you know um they have a lot they have a fuller flavor, you know, a lot of uh, more complex mm -hmm. flavors. Um, so, you know, it's, it's all individual taste. It really is. We have another question here. Um, I heard you mention Baker Creek. I was thinking about ordering them <coughs> from them this year because um, I wanted to tr <coughs> try my hand at seed saving. I'm not going to do it with carrots because there's just no way <laughs> that's going to happen. But um, would you suggest heirloom varieties over hybrid varieties? If you want to save seed, for sure. Okay. Um, Hybrids won't go through the seed. And Baker right. Creek has got, he's really expanded his northern hardy stuff. But you have to make sure and really read what you're getting mm -hmm. because he has some things that are really appropriate for the south that don't. Generally do speaking, longer. if he doesn't yeah. have the days on it, it's <laughs> Missouri or. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, but yeah we're. We're going to order probably every color of carrot we possibly can this year. So we order mostly from uh, either Baker Creek, uh, John, I mean, the ones that we mail order. Baker Creek, Johnny Selected Seeds, Territorial Seeds, um, and what's the other one? Uh, there's one other one. Oh, high mowing seeds. Yeah, They're from Vermont, okay. northern Vermont. Uh, maybe. You know, and, and that's one thing that I'm pretty excited about trying to get a local seed savers exchange group going. I'm really glad that she was wanting to put that together because um, that'll offer us the opportunity to breed plants that really are regionally specific mm -hmm. for the UP and that would be a good thing. Well, we ran, mm -hmm. there was an article on NPR not too long ago about using libraries as, as seed exchange programs. Mm -hmm. So. <coughs> Oh, that's yeah. interesting. Yeah. I, I know that we found, because really we've been it. growing. <laughs> 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 yeah. No, we don't want everyone in here asking for seeds. We've uh, been growing this one uh, squash. It's called Lakota squash, and we're on about, I don't know, it must be ninth or tenth generation. No, but we got them originally from Tammy Byron, who had had them for several years. But the ones that we first started out with, we grew from seed. But I notice now, after so many generations, these things are getting riper. It seems like earlier almost right. every year. They're getting just, a, you know, maybe just by a few days. And they're originally from South Dakota, North Dakota, the Lakota Sioux. Right, they're an old heirloom from the Sioux tribe, the Lakota Sioux. Lakota Sioux. <laughs> Any more questions? Well, I hope we've answered everything that's good as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Deanna and Cindy and John, and I think probably everybody found a lot of good information here this evening. Yeah. Really appreciate if anybody's it. interested in any of like a brochure on the that fertilizer, I can give it to you. All right. Thank you very much for coming.